here are a few examples that are already paving the way for such transition. And you, we will also discuss how we can go even further to achieve carbon neutrality. Uh, before presenting our five speakers, let me remind you um, that you cannot, uh, as participants, speak, but you can ask questions through the chat box. And I will take care of collecting these questions and to ask them to the speakers at the end of each presentation and also um, at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. Another way of asking questions is through Slido, if you, if you know it. Um, it's written here uh, at the bottom of uh, the slide. You can join the website Slido, use the code ctrack 50 webinar and ask questions there. And I will also collect them. Um, so this webinar is being recording at the moment, recorded the, the slides and the, the recording will be available afterwards and I will send it to all of you that have registered in advance. Uh, so now, without further ado, I suggest uh, I present the speakers. So first of all, we will have uh, Alexandra Papadopoulou, uh, who is a senior energy expert at the National Technical University of Athens and also the CTRAC50 project coordinator. Alexandra has worked closely with numerous municipalities for the presentation and the preparation sorry, of their SEAPs and SECAPs and has over 11 years of experience in managing national and European energy projects. She will present CTRAC 15 in more details. Afterwards, you will hear from Roberto Rinaldi from the European Committee of the Regions, who is here with us today to report on the COP25, which has just ended last week in Madrid. As you might know, the Committee of the Regions is the EU's assembly of local and regional representatives, and its goal in Madrid was to advocate the achievements and commitments of European cities and regions in the fight against global warming. Elina Sepanen is also here with us today. She's oh, somebody is talking. Can you please turn off your microphones? Thank you. When you join. Sorry. So I was uh, presenting Elina Sepanen. Um, Elina is energy and climate specialist for Tampere, a Finnish city which is regularly put in the spotlight for its ambitious climate and energy actions. Currently, sont coupés, sont activés. Currently, in charge of connecting strategic goals with concrete actions. Elena will present the Smart Tampere 2030 strategy in which the city sets to be carbon neutral by 2030 already. Afterwards, you will hear Hiram Palos Litos, who is scientific partner of the Greek municipality of Shania, one of the municipalities selected by the Citra 50 project to receive support in the development, implementation and financing of long-term climate and energy plans. Mr. Litos will thus present you the initiatives carried out in Shania to reduce CO2 emissions. And last but not least, Catherine Prema is uh, here as well. She's Head of Sustainable Energy and Climate Territorial Projects at the Regional Energy Agency of Auvergne-Rhône-Alpes in France. And she's also a fellow project partner inside CTRAC50. She will present her work on energy planning within the region of Auvergne-Rhône-Alpes and inside the CTRAF50 project. So before uh, passing the floor to our uh, brilliant speakers, who are all working towards carbon neutrality at their own level, I would like to run uh, a quick poll just to make sure that uh, everyone is fully awake, that you are active with us and that you are ready to hear about uh, technical and political com serious topics. So please, uh, join us on Slido. Uh, you can use it either on your uh, computer or on your uh, smartphone. You can even maybe have the app already. Uh, so here is the, the address, slido.com. You use CTRAC50 webinar as a code. And uh, soon you will see uh, a poll appear. I will leave you a few minutes. It will be very easy questions just to make sure that uh, that you are here with us. Um, one second. Oh. 
Okay, I think now you should see the poll and you should be able to answer it. I told you this would be very easy. I'm just curious about who you are working for. Um, it's always interesting for organizers and for speakers to, to know their audience. So are you working for a municipality, a region, an energy agency, a private company, a university research center, a nonprofit organization, a new institution, or something else? I leave you just a, a few minutes to, to answer and to connect. Okay, I see some of you are there already. 38 answers already. Forty-two. Okay, about half of the people have answered. Do do we have more answer? It's an easy one. Hello. Yes, Sharon Palace. Yes, I can hear you, Melissa. I can hear you too. Do you want anything else from me up to now? Uh, no, I think for now it's fine. I will uh, pass on the floor okay. to you uh, during your presentation. Thank you for being nice. here already. Okay. Okay. You can turn off your microphone for now, I think. Okay. Uh, so I think I will close the, the votes for now. Let's just see the answers. Okay, so actually we have a lot of energy agencies in the crowd, nonprofit organizations, and then it's more or less the same percentages. Universities, okay. So we have a majority of energy agencies, which is actually not that surprising since energy agencies are often supporting the local and regional authorities uh, in, their, in their plans, so it makes sense. Anyway, uh, all the categories that we see here have a role to play in uh, the energy transition towards carbon neutrality. So uh, welcome to all of you, of course. Uh, I have a, a second question for you, and then we will start the presentations. So why did you decide to join this webinar? An easy one, again. Is your city or region uh, already involved in a, in a plan towards carbon neutrality? Would you like to start such a plan? Or you just want to hear about the results from COP25, from uh, an expert from the Committee of the Regions? Or more simply, do you simply want to get inspired by ambitious cities and regions who are presenting with us today? Once again, I will leave just a few seconds or minutes. Still more people answering. Okay, let's close it for now and see the results. You want to get inspired by ambitious cities and regions, half of you at least. Well, this is the place to be then. Uh, you've seen the program. I've already presented uh, very briefly the speakers. So I'm sure that uh, the inspiration will be there. How many of you did start planning for carbon neutrality? Still 28% of people who answered. That's, that's very good. Uh, I think you were on the right track. Um, a few people would like to start planning and to hear about COP25. Okay, thank you very much for answering. I'm sure these results are um, interesting for, for me at least and for the speakers. Uh, and in any case, whether you have started a plan or would like to start one, get inspired by ambitious cities or to hear about COP25, 
all of these items will be answered in the in the next minutes and the next hour or so. So uh, you've come to the right place. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now turn on the slides again. Um, okay, and so uh, it is time for me to, to pass the floor to our first speaker, who is Alexandra Papadopoulou from the National Technical University of Athens. So I will pass the floor to Alexandra. Alexandra, are you here with us? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you, I can see you. Great. Perfect. So good morning, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to hold this uh, first webinar and uh, to be able to make a short introduction on the CITRAC 50 project and the results that we have achieved so far, briefly, just to give you an insight. So the CITRAC 50 project is a project funded by the Horizon 2020 program. It is coordinated by the National Technical University of Athens and it has a duration of 36 months. Uh, we still, uh, we are a bit over the middle of uh, the project. And uh, we are 13 partners covering 11 countries in Europe. Uh, we have two networks participating, Federen and Inclay. And uh, besides uh, the NTUA and another Greek partner, EPTA, we have different regional energy agencies and two regions, uh, uh, the region of Riga and the region of Vojevodstvo. So you can see more info on the partners and uh, who we are on the project website. So about the objectives of uh, the project, uh, first of all is to enhance the cooperation between the different levels of governance. Basically, uh, we are working to promote uh, multi-level uh, governance uh, at the vertical and the horizontal level in 11 European countries. Uh, a, key, uh, a key component to this is to work with the regions in order to help them adopt the national strategic policy priorities and capitalize on synergies and economies of scales, and simultaneously to do some capacity building of the regional and local authorities on long-term uh, policy planning, policy implementation, and financing. Uh, some of the results, expected results of the project uh, is to develop 116 sustainable uh, energy and policy uh, and climate action plans for 2015 at the local and the regional level. Uh, to support the municipalities in developing 105 uh, funding proposals and, of course, to engage uh, as many possible stakeholders across EU. So, regarding the challenges, uh, you see that um, as we are working on multi-level governance, we are working with local authorities, national authorities and regions, of course, but uh, nevertheless, uh, energy planning institutes, funding institutes and the citizens are also engaged in this process. The two key challenges that we are trying to address in the project is the, the lack of multi-level collaboration that has uh, been observed in the energy and climate policy planning, as well as the limited experience in long-term planning at all governance level. So far, I mean, the municipalities and the regions, if they are doing the plans, the municipalities are planning till 2030. So we haven't been able to identify examples of uh, municipalities, perhaps there are a few that, of municipalities working on a level, on a further um, policy horizon. Uh, this is a slide just to give you an overview of uh, the multi-level collaboration for some of you that may not be aware of the term. Basically, this means that um, we need to connect better the actors uh, at the horizontal, uh, meaning horizontal between the ministries, for example, or between the regions, as well as the vertical level. So the collaboration between the regions and the municipalities, the municipalities and their local stakeholders. Uh, a brief insight on the work so far. So following the launch of an open call in the majority of the countries, uh, 132 municipalities have been selected uh, to be supported by the CITRAC 50 project across the 11 countries. 
the overall population that uh, these local authorities um, cover is uh, 14 million inhabitants, more than 14 million inhabitants. And the work, uh, a large part of the work that has been conducted so far is engaging uh, the stakeholders at the national, regional and local level through numerous uh, roundtables that have been conducted. So overall, we have done uh, approximately 50 roundtables with representatives from ministries, uh, from, uh, regional, from regions, from local authorities, as well as other national stakeholders uh, to identify the problems, to, to see the challenges and to uh, have potential recommendations on this. Uh, also, we have worked with our municipalities uh, in order to identify promising project proposals uh, that can be expected to deliver significant energy savings and greenhouse gas reduction. Finally, the project so far has organized a, a number of high-level events. We have participated inside events in COP24 and COP25, as well as uh, we have co-organized a policy session during the EU Sustainable Energy Week 2019. No, so, some... some I'm sorry, there is... Sorry, could you someone please, uh, there is some background noise from one of the... Sorry, yeah, I turned it off. It was a participant. Okay, thank you. So, uh, regarding the challenges uh, that we have acknowledged at the energy and climate policy planning level for uh, regional and local authorities, uh, one of the first difficulties is the lack of assigned roles at the local and the regional level in the overall decision-making process process. So it's not clear sometimes exactly what are the responsibilities in policy planning at the regional or the local level. There is a mixed uh, uh, legislative framework uh, and uh, it can be dispersed. I mean, uh, it can be fragmented. Uh, regional authorities can have uh, a, certain, a, a specific part of uh, policy planning uh, while uh, there is no, uh, there might be overlap or no collaboration uh, with the local authorities that have undertaken a different uh, part of the, of the planning itself. Uh, one of the second challenges uh, is the lack of resources and uh, a unified methodology to follow. So in terms of the methodology, a methodological approach can be the one of the Covenant of Mayors, uh, but uh, our suggestion, is we think it is much preferable that a, a country has uh, adopted a specific methodology uh, for uh, policy planning uh, at the regional and the local level. Uh, also, there is the lack of um, national and regional framework for monitoring and managing the policy planning. So, besides having the plan, it is very important on how you monitor and how you follow up with the plan. Uh, very important challenge as well, the fragmented implementation in terms of financing. Uh, we require from the regions, from the municipalities, uh, that uh, they make ambitious plans, but sometimes the financing is not uh, coherent, is not provided in terms to, to support these uh, municipalities in order to be able to cope with these challenges. Um, and of course, uh, as mentioned before, there is this lack of collaboration that has been observed between the regional and the local level, uh, although they have to cover to a certain extent uh, um, similar uh, responsibilities in terms of the planning. Uh, what we have been able to understand is that uh, the, basically the regions and the regional energy agencies can be an important uh, player, can be a real moderator between uh, the governments and the municipalities in order to facilitate the whole process of the planning. Uh, I'm also going to present you briefly some of the recommendations uh, from the country roundtables regarding the how can we facilitate a bit more um, the, national, the, the local and the regional level? So, the first uh, recommendation is uh, perhaps to do a, a survey at the regional level uh, of what are the needs of each region. Uh, usually, each region at uh, each national level has different needs, different priorities. So, uh, identify the regional needs, and each region can do it also uh, in collaboration with each municipality is very important in order to have uh, a strong uh, long-term strategic policy planning. Uh, another thing is to have uh, to develop specific dedicated tools to support uh, multi-level governance. Another suggestion is uh, for regional and local authorities to have the regulatory obligation uh, 
for preparing uh, policy plans. And uh, of course, the assignment of specific uh, reduction targets at the regional level, this is the effort sharing uh, approach that um, is not so common, but has been tried. Uh, this approach uh, should be linked uh, with uh, financing incentives. So regions can be able, if they undertake uh, higher targets and higher commitments, of course, always based on their potential and uh, always following a consultation uh, with the national level, nothing imposed on them. Uh, they should be provided um, the additional incentives for uh, financing incentives to, to implement these plans. Um, another very important topic is, uh, as you mentioned so far, there is the fragmented uh, planning. So many municipalities, many regions do a lot of plans different plans that are not connected. So uh, one major challenge is to try to have all these municipal departments, the, regional, the regions collaborating between them in order to connect these plans, to connect urban spatial planning with uh, climate uh, mitigation and climate adaptation actions. Um, all these actions, as mentioned, need to connect it at the regional level. And of course, uh, one of the needs identified uh, that was expressed by many regions and uh, municipalities is that uh, they need support, they need um, capacity building for the regional energy and climate managers uh, that uh, are in place or should be in place uh, in, in, in the authorities. Finally, it is considered very successful to create a, a space for dialogue. Uh, and this is something that has been triggered um, in uh, at the regional level very successfully, for example, in France, and uh, Catherine could uh, say a few words uh, more about this, and to have uh, dedicated uh, steering committees or technical working groups that coordinate the work. Uh, of course, another suggestion is that uh, a common methodological basis, as mentioned before, this was one of the challenges that was acknowledged, that uh, there is no uniform uh, way to do this policy planning, to collect the data, to report the data, to develop the actions. A common methodological approach would be very um, supportive in uh, the whole process and would also facilitate uh, the fact that uh, these plans could be afterwards comparable and could facilitate the national authorities in monitoring this, uh, these plans. Uh, finally, just uh, to mention that uh, a roundtable uh, at the EU level with uh, representatives from uh, ministries, from regions and regional energy agencies was realized in Athens uh, on uh, the 17th of September. And um, here the feedback uh, is that uh, all, the, all the challenges faced at the national level were acknowledged and the inefficient national framework, as well as lack of multi-level governance, are considered one, two of the key points that uh, are hampering the long-term policy planning uh, um, efforts. Uh, one, another, another point that was raised is that the, the, the long financial cost, because usually when we are uh, discussing about long-term policy planning, when we are discussing about uh, adoption of renewable energy technologies uh, and ambitious targets, we are also focusing uh, mainly on the costs that these um, technologies may bring. Uh, it was pointed out that uh, sometimes uh, the social impacts from the implementation uh, of these activities should be further analyzed and considered, as well as uh, whether uh, when we are doing an overfocus perhaps in renewables is
other sont coupés. Um, but uh, and in France, there is the only, the only country that they are doing. Uh, the municipalities have a, cert, a specific, um, let's say, uh, obligations uh, to um, to report. Uh, the other countries as well have specific obligations, but it uh, depends on the population. Um, our suggestion is that um, this obligation should be applied without uh, taking into account uh, specific, um, uh, let's say, restrictions in the population, that uh, the energy policy and planning should be compulsory uh, for all the municipalities, uh, that the methodological approach should be developed uh, at the ministry level. But when we were discussing uh, with uh, the ministries, the feedback that uh, we got was some reluctance in adopting something that uh, is already, uh, let's say, voluntary. Uh, they consider that uh, they cannot apply something that is voluntary. And uh, if there is uh, a framework to be applied, this should be designed at the national level. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so active. Then you also saw there are like municipalities, region, and so on, are now starting to do planning. They, they have, as I understood, the target was yes, 105 yes. or 150 cents. Yes, so at last plan under the development. Yes. Yes. So do you like your base is is coming from the national target, like national uh, climate and energy targets, or where do you touch base? Where where have you started this work? Um, the plans we are doing, uh, we are considering the carbon neutrality target. So yes, we, we have based our work on the region, on the uh, plans that have uh, recently been announced uh, for 2030, and we are also basing our work on the plans that have been. Not all the countries have them already, but there has been some preparatory work for the plans for 2050. Uh, they have a roadmap, or they have some uh, planning already in place. So we have studied the, these plans at its country level and uh, we are trying to adopt uh, to adjust them uh, to each municipality's needs because you know each municipality has its specific needs so we are taking ideas of what will be the policy planning at the national level and we are trying to adjust it at the local one okay great thank you for all the answers um, hi there, I'm very sorry we had a technical problem at the Federal office, so I think we missed uh, maybe the one or two questions, uh, so I wasn't able to collect them, but I, I see that uh, Alexandra, you were already able to answer a question, so that's great. Um, it, does anyone else have a question before we pass the floor to the second speaker? Um, I check. Okay, I don't think we have in, any questions in the in the chat box. Uh, so we can uh, we can uh, pass the floor to the second speaker, who is uh, Roberto Rinaldi. Um, I'm just checking that. Uh, is able to connect right now. It might take a few minutes. Uh, ah, okay. We have a question actually from Diego. Sorry, Diego, I haven't seen it. I will check it now. We have two questions from Slido, so uh, I will put on the questions. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for your presentation, by the way. Um, let me take back the screen and show the questions. Um, let's see. Ah, okay. Okay, I see the questions, but I cannot show them to you on the screen, so it's okay. I will just pass them to Alexandra. First question from Diego Piedra from FNR. Do you take the German bioenergy communities into account? 
Alexandra, if you want to answer this one. Yes. Uh, to be honest, uh, because the work is conducted at the, at the national level, uh, our German partner is working with uh, our German partner is Zikle, and is collaborating with uh, the municipalities. Uh, I'm I'm not aware if they have uh, done uh, any consultation with the various communities that you mentioned. Okay, thank you. And second question, uh, anonymous question. How many municipalities of c 50 are using the Covenant of Mayors methodology? The approach that we have uh, adopted is that, first of all, not all the municipalities that uh, we are collaborating with are uh, signatories of the Covenant of Mayors, and not uh, they are obliged to become signatories of the Covenant of Mayors if they do not uh, wish. Uh, we have used the Covenant of Mayors uh, approach as, as an uh, approach that the majority of the municipalities are familiar with, uh, but, uh, for example, in other countries that there are um, other uh, national systems in place, like in France, uh, the approach that uh, they adopt can be adjusted. Um, so, in general, the majority of the countries where there is no national, let's say, another national approach, uh, use the covenant of mayors, but they have the possibility to adjust it uh, to the way they fit possible. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. Um, I believe that's it for the questions. Let me check on Slido. Um, yes, okay, so thank you very much, Alexandra. We will now have a presentation on the COP25 by Roberto Rinaldi. Um, Again, I'm very sorry we're experiencing uh, technical issues in the office, which never happens. Obviously, it had to be today. So I will be the one showing the slides, uh, but Roberto will uh, still give his presentation as planned. Um, give me one minute to retrieve the, the slides for this COP25 presentation. In the meantime, I hope that you can hear me. Perfectly, yeah. Roberto. So you're already here with us. Great. Um, nice. In the, in the meantime, I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is uh, Roberto Rinaldi, and I'm working as a policy officer on biodiversity and climate change at the European Committee of Regions. And as, uh, as Melissa was mentioning before today, I would like to briefly uh, present the main activities that the Committee of the Regions uh, did at the COP25 in, uh, in Madrid that happened in the first two of the uh, December this year. And if we go directly to the second slide, I can show you what I'm going to talk to you today. I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about what the COR is and then uh, the activities of the COR at Dubai. And then I will comment a little bit more on the main outcomes of COP25 and a quick reflection on uh, towards the COP26. On the next slide, you can see that uh, the Committee of the Regions, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is um, one of the EU, uh, European Union institutions that is involved into the policy-making process of the European Union. The, um, the European uh, Committee of the Regions voices uh, the regions and see this point of view in, uh, within the policy-making system. It uh, represents local and regional authorities across the European Union and advises also the other European Union institutions on how the new laws that are um, under discussion, either at the European Parliament, uh, Commission or the Council, may have an impact on uh, regions and cities. The COR is a um, political assembly composed of 350 members. These members are locally or regionally from all over uh, the EU, and they are grouped, as you can see in the image on your left, 
uh, on, uh, by political party and they are headed by a uh, president. Um, some, just to give you an example of who these members could be, they could be either mayors of presidents of regions and uh, we have a wide range of members going from a small city in the countryside to uh, big cities, big capital cities and uh, regions. The, the members that come to Brussels to debate and adopt legislative documents, they are called opinions. These opinions legislate on specific proposed uh, legislation and uh, we could also, um, the COR could also adopt uh, resolutions and this was the case a few weeks ago on the resolution on the European Green Deal. This resolution has been actually discussed uh, and uh, adopted during our last plenary and it was done with the participation of the executive vice president uh, Franz Timmermans. And why do uh, why the, the COR uh, is existing? Well, let's not forget that 70% uh, of all EU legislation is implemented by local and regional authorities, and it is therefore important that uh, cities and regions have their say in the European Union legislation, but also it is important they have their say at the global level, and uh, uh, this is why um, we, you can see here in the picture of the uh, COR delegation to the COP25. Uh, as you can see, um, here you have uh, some of the members with the vice president, and the slide shows you a little bit of the figures uh, behind our participation to COP25. Uh, the figures should come in a few seconds. And uh, we, we'll let, without focusing on the figures, let's focus more on the COP25 outcome. And uh, from what it's been the experience, um, the topic of uh, bottom-up approach, vertical integration and uh, multi-level governance, uh, these have been the key aspects that came across uh, during the most frequently um, during the side events of COP25. Uh, I think that you can see these messages in the, in the next slide. And uh, the other topics that have also been involved um, into the discussions were also the technological uh, and technology and innovation as well as uh, financing. And, uh, and Throughout the different events, there seems to be an international consensus on the role of subnational governments, and uh, which means that all form of authorities below the national level and most importantly um, the local level, the, they can overcome the lack of national ambitions that very often we've seen in uh, in climate. And uh, in parallel to this, on the negotiation side. Um, unfortunately, this was not really reflected. Um, I don't know if you can see the, the document now. It's on the next slide, you can, there is uh, actually the link to the conclusions of the COP25. And uh, um, the language and the approach of the COP still seem not to fully recognize and formally recognize the key role that subnational governments have. And when I say talk about subnational governments, I mean uh, any form of government below the national level. And so the COR, together with other stakeholders, we um, attempted to convey this message beyond the European uh, Union. Unfortunately, this was not really successful, uh, but we at least attempted to it. And uh, apparently this is something that we will see a little bit more in the next COP. And well, this is why the committed regions joined the, the call for increased climate uh, ambition and action by national governments, uh, including the full engagement of local and regional governments. This call has been launched by the local governments and the municipal authorities constituency, which represents uh, the networks of local and regional governments at the UNFCCC process since 1995. And uh, just to conclude on my next slide, I want to, to give you a little bit of a hint of um, what's coming next. Um, there is an increased ambition, climate ambition and action that it's needed by national governments. This uh, increased ambition 
has to include the full engagement of local and regional governments in the preparation for the uh, review, renewed and reviewed uh, nationally determined contributions. This renew, uh, review will happen uh, throughout next year and uh, what we um, are going to do is that together with the local and regional governments we, uh, are, we are advocating to set out the six priorities which you can see here uh, on the screen. And uh, these are six prior priorities that will, be, um, will enable and uh, support local and regional authorities to uh, contribute to the achievement of national targets uh, on the climate. And as regards the, the COR, from our side, we will continue through uh, our members and our interinstitutional dialogue to advocate for a more ambitious climate action that can only be achieved through collaboration with the support and support of local and regional governments. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to address them to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto, for uh, this uh, nice and uh, short presentation, which leaves enough time for questions. So please do not hesitate to, to ask them through the chat box or to Slido. I will check Slido right now to see if we have any new ones already. Um, not yet, but actually I had a, a question. So you, you said and you made us understand that uh, most world leaders do not seem to be ready to involve subnational um, levels of governance in, in their actions and maybe in their plans. Do, did you hear any arguments or is it just that they're not aware that most of the work is being done at the local and regional level and will have to be done at the local and regional level? Do, do you know why? Did you hear something about this? I didn't officially hear uh, anything about uh, this, but uh, I can tell you that uh, what's, uh, what the only way for convincing the, the national government and the parties of the COP, uh, of the COP is to show them the, the action that it's, that's done at the subnational uh, level. So what, we, what I invite to do is to to have all the cities and regions, all the local and regional authorities that uh, are here participating today to cooperate together with uh, energy agency, to cooperate with the university and all other stakeholders in order to um, implement the climate action. And uh, as a result, the, once then we have the achieved results, we can then um, show to the to the national governments that cities and regions are part of the solution. Okay, that's uh, that's actually very encouraging uh, for a network like Federen, who is always showcasing local and regional initiatives. So thank you for that. Thank you for our participants. I think you all heard this encouraging message. We have uh, one more question, an anonymous question. How can local municipalities support the work of the Committee of the Regions towards COP26? Well, actually, I think you kind of answered it already, but if you have more elements. Yes, they can, uh, they can be involved. They, the, the authorities, they first should check if they, or if they have uh, one of our 350 members as their local or regional representative. If they do, then through their member, they could um, be involved into the preparatory work. Uh, otherwise, uh, you, can, you saw the email address to which to contact us, the Commission uh, Secretariat, and uh, from there we, we can to work together in the, in the preparation towards COP26. This is for the European uh, level, let's say. And from the local level, well, you can already uh, start working on the on climate and energy action and uh, keep us uh, in, in updated with uh, your achievements so that uh, there is a possibility to present those at uh, COP16, COP26, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, actually we have one more question, I believe. Did you mention that regional work towards COP26 shall be monitored? If yes, can you tell more about how that will happen? 
The, at the moment, uh, we are waiting for more uh, information on this. So if uh, you contact me by email, I can come back to you on this because we are waiting for more information on how this is going to happen towards COP26. Okay, and uh, one more question from Luca Vignoli. European legislation, Italian legislation, etc., is a big problem because it prevents the collection of energy data. And if you can collect them later, you cannot communicate to research, study, planning, etc. Privacy laws. Actually, it was more a comment than a question. Um, and I do have one more question here now. In the pie chart, tariffs was one of the topic discussed. Does this relate to CO2 tax tariffs? If so, has any consensus been reached on how to calculate this? Maybe I can go back to the slide, actually. Yeah, the, so basically just to, I don't know if we can see the slide again, yeah. but these were the topics that were discussed and uh, throughout the COR communication channels. And uh, I think that the tariffs here uh, refers to the Green Deal, uh, European Green Deal communication. And uh, there is already some discussion going on about the carbon tax, the carbon taxation. And uh, no, at the moment there is no uh, agreement reached because the discussion is still at the preliminary uh, stage. Uh, and we have also Sika Hadeva who is asking, is there any official info on what are the various countries and regions managing so far in completing the 2020 goals? Mm, not, that, not that I'm aware of, uh, an official one. So I, would, I will uh, have a look and come back to you on this one, because as, of, as far as I'm aware, there are no official uh, monitoring instruments that capture this information. Sika says thank you very much and I also thank you very much Roberto for this nice presentation and I see we have a lot of interest so I'm happy to see that uh, I know on the technical side local and regional authorities and their stakeholders do a lot but you still get involved in the political decisions which is also a, an important aspect so thanks to all of you for your engagement. I think now it is time to pass the floor to uh, our third speaker, with Elina Sepanen from the city of Tampere. Elina, are you here with us now? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Good morning. Thank you for being here. And I will pass the floor to you in a few seconds. Okay, I'm changing it. You can now show your slides and your webcam if you wish. Turn on the presentation. Come on. There we go. Can you see that? Not yet, but I think uh, it's normal. It usually takes uh, a few seconds. Let's be patient. Perfect. We see it. Okay. All right. In the meantime, so I'm a uh, I'm the climate and energy expert from Tampere, city of Tampere, Finland, and uh, I was asked to present about our carbon neutrality uh, program but I'm actually going to go more into the thinking behind it. Um, we're currently updating the whole roadmap, but in the latest city strategy, we actually have a very ambitious goal, goal for uh, carbon neutrality. So just a few words so that you know a little bit about Tampere, since you're from all over Europe. We are a city of about 230,000 people at the moment. Uh, but in the Northern Europe, that's the biggest inland city, actually, as far as I know. We're also a very growing city. Uh, we got about 4,000 more people last year. That's a rounded number, but the growth is around 1.4% at, at the moment. And we're trying to adjust to that while also being sustainable. And I think the growth mostly is due to the fact that we have a great location, but also we are a university city in Finland and we have a strong IT sector. Nokia is our neighbor. 
sont coupés. It used to be more industrial, but now it's more more digitalized. The the whole working scene. And uh, I was happy to see that our politicians um, agreed in the latest city strategy uh, that we need to be more sustainable. And we had a push uh, for providing the information that carbon neutrality by 2050, which used to be our goal, is actually almost business as usual by now. So we should have tighter uh, climate goals. So we, we ended up with carbon neutrality by 2030, which is tight. It, it's going to require work. And not in 100% sure we will reach it, but it's something that we should go for. And then uh, the good thing is that we also combined climate work, which we've been doing already for several years, by, with sustainable development. So we also mention all the sustainability goals um, in, in our strategy. And I think this is very crucial for the whole process. Well, as, as Melissa already said, we also have a definition for carbon neutrality, since that's not exactly a, a thing that's defined somewhere. Uh, we reduce greenhouse gases emissions by at least 80% compared to 1990, and then um, strive for compensating the rest. And this side is, is something we're working on hard right now. Then we have, um, besides the strategy, we have sort of an environmental policy that's called Gu Guidelines for Sustainable Tampere 2030. And I like the new approach that we took um, at uh, impact assessment and partnership included in this policy. So there's a lot of talk about we, how we should develop towards uh, assessing impacts, like Alexandra was already talking about, that we need to monitor what we were doing and uh, also react to adverse changes, but also try to anticipate things. And then, of course, um, being partners with all, all uh, different organizations in the city. Now, my point of view is actually sort of a top-down approach. Uh, what I do is, is I calculate the... I work with the emissions. Um, here's an emission development of Tampere, uh, which looks really nice. We're actually at minus 29, so way beyond uh, the covenant of mayors. And per capita, that looks even nicer since we are a growing city. Um, but in this, I mean, this uh, picture is very nice, but it doesn't tell you that much. So what we need to go is uh, go a little bit deeper. And what is it that causes our emissions? Uh, there's space heating. Uh, we're in Finland, so a lot of the emissions actually come from space heating, that because of the climate, for example. Uh, even though we have very efficient networks and we have efficient houses, there's still a lot of work to do there. Then there's traffic, like most big cities. It's one of our main main emission sources and private electricity consumption. The rest of it becomes a little less meaningful, but then again, if we're actually striving for minus 80, then all of it has to change. And uh, there's been this discussion of what can we change? What, what can we affect? Because some of the cities, especially we work with the neighboring region or the whole region of Tampere and the neighboring cities, some of them are frustrated because we can't really change our emissions because of the methodology. We, we have a certain methodolo methodology in Finland that a lot of cities have adopted. It's not from the national government, but it's by a consultancy that can provide uh, suitable uh, results for all of us. So I think we should approach the fa facts, what are the things that we can change and the things that we can't change. And the key thing here is, is telling the difference, of course. Um, that means we need to look inside the box. Um, what I mean here is that the emission calculations often tend to be a black box. We don't always know what's in there. We just had our SECUP uh, published. And I have to say, I'm not entirely happy with the calculations we got from a consultant because I don't know what happened there uh, most of the time. And when I ask questions, I realize that it's not very defined. Uh, it doesn't help me much, that information. So we have to ask these questions of where, where does it come from, how the different sectors behave. And then the most important thing is producing in the understandable information for decision making. In my opinion, this is the key to scaling up. What we really need to do is, is use money differently. And that comes from politicians. There's no way, no way around that. Um, so you can break the emissions goal down. So here we have the all, all the different sectors that we are calculating, calculating emissions in. And then we have 
the goal for each of them differently because transport is a hard one. It's only minus 55. But district heating is something that we are working on. We are on a nice track. We can do a lot. It's minus 89. For heat boilers, this basically means heating with oil, uh, small houses or, or um, industry halls that we have a solution for. We can use ground source heat pumps, so we should expect high results. And I think um, it's hard to see, but heat boilers and transport here are highlighted, which means that these are the two things that we need to be working on now. Uh, these are two things that we, we can change or we have to start changing now in order to have an effect in the next 10 years. Going even further, we can see that the share of transport here um, is analyzed like separately from the total. The whole column is the total emissions and then there's the share of transport in darker blue uh, and the comparison year from 90. And you can see that there isn't that much change actually going on. So if you go into what happens there, uh, you can look at the emission coefficient. Of course, traffic is a hard sector. I chose a hard one because there's so many different sources of emission, different fuels and so on. But then again, as it says on the bottom, city has little to no effect on the coefficient there, but the consumption side, where uh, we think of how and where the, the consumption comes from, how is it formed, then the city can have a major impact on that uh, through urban planning to name one. There's actually more that we can do, but mo most of it has to do with urban planning, how much people have to move, how nice it is to walk and bike and so on. Unfortunately, there's not enough data available in Finland to analyze further and I think this is the situation in most countries. We don't really know what's what things what can we do in urban planning to actually change the behavior of people and this is something that needs to be analyzed further somewhere hopefully not me. Mm, here's a few examples of the action that we are taking in the in the field of traffic just to name a few. Um, we're producing there's a biogas plant about to come to life um, we have a, the whole city master plan that's being made has a CO2 impact assessment. And uh, then the public transport is now being con considered, like, what do we do with it? We have a, a trial in electric buses and we're building, having a huge investment in building a light tram through the city. But then I think there's still a lot of work here to think what it is really that we need to do. Just a short example of what, what kind of information we could produce. Um, let's say our goal is to have a low emission bus fleet, then we can sort of analyze the different options from different points of view and produce this um, information in a simple enough way for politicians to understand. And then the decision making needs to be done there, but they, they can do these sort of big decisions, let's say. Just to wrap up a few very slides of mine. Um, this looks complicated, but actually the idea is that we need to do further analysis. What we used to do is that we had a city strategy, the, the big blue one up there, and then at the bottom you have the actions like pilots, projects, uh, different city units doing climate action, and now we're trying to develop this way further to sort of analyze what happens in between. And like I said, there's the carbon neutrality vision I talked about at the beginning. There's the emissions vision you saw at some point, and you get numbers from there of what actually needs to change in the city. Uh, also, you can set target values for sustainability indicators, and these indicators need to be different from CO2. Measuring CO2 is very abstract and very actually inefficient, slow, and a little bit um, vague. So if we measure other things like traffic and energy consumption and this kind of things it's faster to get it get, get in touch with how the actions are actually affecting and then from the actions we build the roadmap that's still under construction and then we will do some assessments on um, those actions in there and try to set priorities so we have to do forecasting and backcasting at the same time and combine systems thinking with grassroots thinking to actually get to this key analysis that we need for the decision making. And here's uh, what I say is carbon neutrality in a nutshell. Uh, what exactly, I also promised to answer what needs to be done. So I think these are the four main points. Uh, first of all, we need to change our working culture in the cities. 
that needs life cycle effects be, need to be taken into account regarding emissions costs and material use in basically everything. And I don't know about other countries, but here it usually doesn't happen so far. So that, that's going to be a major change in how we work in the cities and what, what we think about, what we calculate, what we budget. Then there's the mobility system that really needs to change big time so that we can get the emissions down. There's the energy system that needs to change uh, both production and distribution systems. And then simply this way of working that we make it possible for the citizens to change to a low emission lifestyle. There's so many things that we can't leave to the individuals, but we need to help them with it. Thank you. So activate. Thank you very much, Elena, for an interesting presentation. We already have uh, some questions for you. Uh, first of all, Karsten Hosballer from uh, ICLE in Germany uh, is asking, what were the structural changes within the city administration, if any, in reaction to the climate neutrality target of Tampere? Do departments have a carbon budget and an annual reduction target? Um, <clears throat> I think the change is taking place slowly. What has changed now is, is in the new budget for 2020. We have a climate budget. Uh, it's a very simple, very simple version if you, you compare to the Oslo benchmark. Um, but we did sort of uh, create this carbon neutrality vision for the emissions. And it does state by those, uh, what you saw earlier in this presentation also, uh, which um, sectors need to go where with the emissions. And that's basically now decided by the city council. And it's been, it's raised a lot of interest and a lot of politicians are saying this is really good, that they want this kind of transparency uh, and this kind of material that helps them uh, push the right things forward. Yeah, structurally, otherwise, uh, not much has changed yet. It's going to take a while for the for the whole um, organization to take this up. The topic has been taken up really well. I saw that in, in the new budget we had something like 48 mentions of carbon neutrality all over the budget. So that was really good. The, the message has gone through. But structurally, um, the biggest problems are between units even between like um, whole, we call them service areas. One of them is like urban planning. One of them is more about um, business and economy. And in between you have these problems where you have like um, those that are producing services for schools. So they use the buildings that we have. And then there's a different unit that owns the buildings that we have and builds them. And their discussions are the most like fruitful ones uh, where they try to find new ways of doing things together. Uh, but that's, I have to say, that's very tricky. We organized a lot of workshops lately. Thank you. I see again, we have a lot of engagement. So thank you to all of you for your questions. Next one is Donna from the Dublin Energy Agency who is asking you, do you have a methodology on how you measure the potential CO2 impact of your municipality development plan? Mm, could you possibly elaborate what you need, mean by a development plan uh, as an urban development or this carbon neutrality plan or? Uh, the impact of... Uh, yeah. Maybe she can uh, directly Okay, urban development. Urban development. It was All right. Yeah, that's the hardest. Uh, in general, measuring the CO2 impact of anything is hard. And like I said, very vague. Um, I would be very careful at sending numbers like that. In my opinion, we need to have a clear CO2 scenario for the future. And then we can say that in this scenario, if, if we do this, it would affect this much. And if we don't do it, then it would affect this much. Urban development is the hardest part of that, especially urban planning, like saying, if we plan like this, it will impact our um, emissions this much is next to impossible. What we have done is a tool that actually calculates um, on a map, the emissions from different 
parts of the city currently and then uh, we have the general city plan that's being made and we insert that into that map and see what happens uh, to the different emissions and we also have a CO2 scenario there uh, what happens in the future but I have to say that that part is um, very hard but what you can do is build these scenarios but taking one action or one part of like a smaller plan and saying this the impact of this is that much is is way harder but we're definitely working on this um, it's one of my issues where we try to figure out for example now in an area what are the basic emissions here and then if we change something can we calculate the impact of that it's hard so Donna actually gave a little bit more explanations regarding her question saying the reason I ask is there is now new legislation in Ireland that we have to measure the impact but very difficult to do as you say um, and we had another question yes you want to come maybe as far as I know the the Finnish legislation is also coming up to that so we're trying to learn how to do it so, so maybe we should have another webinar in a few months on this um, another question about urban planning is from Michael Pornbacher, sorry for spelling it wrong. Um, he's asking, is special energy planning a concrete step that has been taken regarding urban planning? Mm. We have, I wouldn't say that we have a specific energy plan as a whole um, it's basically my responsibility to be aware at least of what is going on we have a very good local power utility that's been that is owned entirely by the city and they're very cooperative with us and they've taken up this uh, percentage since we presented these um, percentages of which um, which emissions have to go down how much they picked up this 89 percent for district heating and made it their plan. So this is what they are really striving for. And they already were in a place where they had to invest in, in renewable energy quite a lot. Um, we're working on thinking about the energy system as a whole, uh, but with a pilot area called Hieran Randa on how sort of piloting how the energy system should be. And we're talking about whole blocks of houses becoming their own energy providers or how how would I translate that um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say we have one single plan but we're getting there in the vision uh, we are also have an energy part which is the first time we ever had an energy policy believe it or not cities in Finland don't tend to do that it used to be a completely national issue energy I think that that's one reason why the national governments don't take cities into account in climate work because they're not used to doing that they used to do climate and energy policy and they used to do it with heavy industry and universities and the government um, they're waking up to the fact that they should listen to us maybe too but I, I wouldn't say we have one single clear plan but that's something I'm uh, that's part of my work to be aware of the things that are going on and trying to bring them together Okay, I will. But I wish ask, in the future we will have one. Sorry, I will ask one more question, a double question, I think, because two are related. And then uh, I think for the others, maybe you can answer it later by email because we have a, a schedule to keep. We still have two more presentations. So sorry for the others. But here are the final questions I will pass on to Elena. First of all, how do you have a citizen dialogue? And I think it's related. The second question from Eugene Collin is you outlined that. This is a top-down approach. Have you considered how to encourage a bottom-up movement to help you achieve your objectives? Well, you hear our weak spots. Um, discussing with the general public is not our uh, greatest moment. Um, this is something that is going to be the future emphasis, I think. Um, the vision, this emission vision you can just see is based on uh, stakeholder work that we we worked with, let's say different stakeholders like universities, associations, companies to create this. But um, next year we will start hopefully a partnership 
thing for like a climate partnership uh, program for at least uh, associations and universities and companies. But to be honest, with uh, with the citizens, we're mainly campaigning for them, and this is something that we really will need to work on for uh, later on. As it's not an entirely top-down approach, um, like I said, there's also the sort of grassroots direction. I think we have to work from both. Um, but when I say grassroots, I think more about the city organization than the actual entire city. So but there's also the bottom-up approach there, but it's more related to the city climate work. Um, there, there's actually, and the, the citizens movement is there. The question is how to tap into that uh, to help them sort of empower them and have them do more. And for that, I hope somebody else has the answer because I don't. Okay, thank you for your honesty. I think it's always important to know what are the strengths, but also what are the weaknesses of each approach and uh, each attempt to achieve uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, so thank you very much, Elena, for this interesting presentation. Now we will move on south. Actually, we will go from Finland to Greece with our next speaker, Keralampos Litos. Keralampos, are you already here with us? If so, you can speak and I will share your screen with the rest of the audience. Lampas, are you here with us? Let's wait a few seconds. Otherwise, if Lampas is not ready, maybe we can directly go to the fifth presentation in order not to lose too much time. Okay, let's do that. Uh, I think Catherine should be already online. Can you hear me, Catherine? Yes, I am online. Great, so if it's not a problem, with you, we will directly move to your presentation and we hope to come back to Keralampas later on. So we still make a great uh, leap forward from North Finland to Western France with Catherine Prema. Uh, I will share your screen one second. Okay, the floor is yours, Catherine. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a few seconds, waiting for my presentation. We can see it, I think. Okay. Do you have the, the screen? Yes? Yes. The presentation. Okay. We can see the slides, we can see you. You can start. Okay, <laughs> okay so I'm going to talk to you um, uh, about low carbon strategy for 2050 in our region and uh, what is being implemented by the regional council and the local communities uh, in our region. So in our uh, Auvergne-Rhône-Alpes region. So uh, first of all, I would like to, um, to, to talk about the national level. Uh, so a, a second version of the low carbon strategy was adopted last year. Uh, in December, uh, this strategy fixed the objective of uh, moving from factor four to neutrality carbon by 2050. And so to um, uh, the national level to, to achieve these objectives, these challenges, fixed also some obligations to the lower level so to the uh, regions, uh, the regions has to uh, implement a scheme uh, which has sectoral and uh, indirect impact on the ecological transition uh, on, for, for instance, land use planning, working on transport infrastructure, on building retrofitting, 
renewable energy development and so on, and also which includes a climate protection. And uh, there's also obligation for uh, public authorities at the local uh, level uh, with the uh, obligation to implement a sustainable energy, air quality and climate action plan. I called it a CCAP. Uh, the, the target is 2030 and uh, it's an obligation for local authorities more than 20,000 of inhabitants. And um, the, region, the regions can also um, support uh, local authorities to, to become a positive energy territory by 2050. So the objective of uh, to become a positive energy territory is to uh, reduce energy consumption by half uh, and to increase uh, renewable energy production in 2050. Okay, so um, in our uh, region, here you have the map covered by uh, the Sustainable Energy, Hair and Climate Action Plans. So the region is 80% uh, of the region is covered by uh, CCAP in, in the time being. Um, uh, after that, I would like to, um, to highlight some key figures about our regions. So, um, so about key figures on, on energy and climate context. So the three sectors uh, as, as the most of uh, territories, I think are most of regions in Europe as uh, the same uh, sectors influenced the energy and, and uh, energy targets. So the three sectors that consume the most energy and meet the most greenhouse gas gases uh, are the building, transport and industry sectors. Uh, for the building sector, for instance, we have uh, in our region three millions of houses. The regional scheme objectives are uh, the energy retrofit of uh, 70 thousands of houses and 20 thousands of public buildings per year. It's it's a very uh, impressive objective, uh, a huge objective. Uh, it means one billion of euros of investments per year, and uh, but also the creation of uh, fifteen thousand of jobs. So uh, regarding the impacts of climate change, we uh, we have also observed an increase of two degrees since 60 years at the re regional level uh, and some other uh, important uh, figures that uh, impact uh, the, the region. Uh, for example, uh, 20 days uh, less of frost than 60 years ago in a city of the north of the region, 40 centimeters of less snow in 30 years uh, in a mid-mountain resort for, uh, and, and so on. So um, the objective of the region uh, to meet these regional challenges uh, and the regional council um, collaborating with the um, national, national Energy Agency and the Ministry decided to support uh, the Positive Energy Territory initiatives in, in our region. So they launched uh, uh, the first call for interest in 2012. And now you can see that we have more than 50% of the region covered by a Positive Energy Territory. So the objective or uh, the target is 2050 and uh, it's really focusing on energy. To, uh, so to, uh, to support uh, these territories, uh, to monitor, to, act, to monitor their action plans, to assess uh, its potential, to identify clues, to prioritize development, 
we uh, as a regional agency developed uh, a web-based tool called Terry Story. Terry Story is a um, is, uh, yes, web tool. Uh, the objective is to uh, to to give um, a set of functions to build, follow up, and assess the territory's trajectory, and also to simulate scenarios. So uh, the um, municipalities and the territories involved in action plans can visualize their uh, socioeconomic, so uh, for example, electric bill reductions, uh, maintained employment, local tax benefits, and also an environmental impacts, so energy saving, greenhouse gas emissions, of their action plans in this tool. For the time being, territories can submit actions on building and mobility sectors, and also uh, actions on the production of renewable energy sources. Uh, the, uh, the, the, of course, they can also visualize uh, the, uh, the, the quantity of energy consumption of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, and the the resource uh, reserves and flows uh, for in in their uh, at a local level and at also at a regional level and our uh, ob ultimate objectives I can say is to uh, aggregate action plans from the local authorities to uh, the regional level and assess how these plans contribute to the regional strategy. Uh, so, um, and this uh, web tool is, is uh, we are developing this web tool uh, is already uh, available uh, on on the web, but we are still uh, is still on, in development. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you. Uh, I'm ready to answer to your questions if you have. Thank you, Catherine. Um, let's see if we have any questions on Slido. Uh, I think not yet. Let me check. This was temporary. So you can both ask questions through Slido or to the chat box directly uh, to Catherine. I will collect them. Um, okay, nothing for now, but I do uh, have one question for you, Catherine. Um, so I know that uh, in France and especially I think in Auvergne-Rhône-Alpes, you uh, you took on a lot of adaptation measures, while in most European regions and cities um, there are a lot of uh, mitigation actions and measures taking place, but it's often harder for them to to take on this adaptation challenge. Do you have any advice um, for them? uh advice <laughs> uh yes we are uh, we are working with the municipalities on the, on their uh, um, on their action plans on vulnerability on uh, on uh, in integrating um climate uh, climate change in their action plans uh in and uh, trying to to have an integrating uh action plan uh, and um, and um, we we are uh, yes a lot of uh, municipalities uh, working on this topic uh, which is um, a very uh, we, you you really need to have an, a very integrated approach because the climate change uh, have an impacts on all sectors and uh, need to uh, to work with uh, several several services and in, inside the uh, inside the municipality but also with uh, a lot of stakeholders and uh, so the object in, and and uh, you also uh, need to uh, have a, a, a long-term vision when you talk about climate change uh, but it's uh, really interesting to to 
to have the feedback of the stakeholders and for the municipalities of elected representatives about these uh, questions. In general, we, we begin by these questions. What uh, uh, did you, uh, what, what are the, uh, according to you, what are the impacts of climate change in, uh, in your municipality or in your territory? And uh, I think it's a good uh, beginning for, uh, for discussions after. Great, thank you very much. We, in the meantime, we had two more questions. One uh, again from Michael Portbacher. Are there any sanctions planned if the regions and cities can't fulfill their goals? Um, for the, yes, for, for the um, uh, sustainable energy, air quality and climate action plans, uh, the um, the municipalities has to um, to 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 monitor and to uh, to implement uh, their uh, CCAP um, uh, before uh, the end of the year, uh, and uh, the ministry and uh, the services inside the ministry uh, check if uh, the action plan uh, is um, uh, achieve the, the, the good targets, first of all, and also uh, if uh, this uh, action plan is uh, current with, uh, with other initiatives, local initiatives or, nat or national initiatives, and if uh, it's uh, also carrying on carrying on uh, uh, at a territorial level. It means uh, if this ac action, if this plan involves uh, the key stakeholders of the, of the territory. Okay. And they have also to, to assess and to, to monitor and to assess uh, this action plan uh, every uh, four years. Okay, thank you. The so there is, sorry, there is a dedicated platform where the municipality has to, to, to record their action plans at a national level. Great. The second question was, what metrics do you use for measuring socioeconomic impacts? Uh, for example, euros per kilowatt for heat, electricity, and euros per kilometer for transport, etc. <laughs> um, we have. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure. I will be able to to answer to, the, to this question uh, uh, in detail because it's uh, a very. Uh, uh, how can I say? A very uh, huge uh, calculation beside the, the the web tool. And I'm not in the development of this web tool, but uh, we uh, we have um, uh, we we based our uh, our calculation on uh, uh, national uh, studies uh, that and uh, with the support of uh, of uh, of uh, experts on these questions of uh, of. Uh, economic impact, so on in terms of employment, but also on euros and uh, so and we we based our calculation on, on uh, national study made by uh, the National Energy Agency. When they realized their um, their uh, national strategy for, uh, for 2050. So uh, in, in, when they, uh, the ministry uh, um, elaborated this uh, national strategy, the uh, energy agency, National Energy Agency, developed a, a, a studies around this question of uh, economic impact. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. I can, I can, I can ask her later by, by mail, by email, if you if you want, 
and uh, because we we have uh, when you're going to this web tool we have all the methodology used to calculate uh, the impacts uh, environmental and socioeconomic impacts but it's in French uh, but I can I can uh, share it in English uh, for some of uh, parameters or calculations if you if you need Yes, I see we have one question, but unfortunately we're running out of time. So you can see Catherine was nice enough to put her email address in her slides. And the slides, as I said, will be available online afterwards. So if there are more questions towards Catherine, please send them by email. Uh, so thank you again, Catherine. And finally, thank we you. can move to the last presentation. Um, the presentation of Hera Lampas from Shania in Greece, and more precisely in Crete. Hera Lampas, were you able to connect now? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me also? Yes, we can hear you perfectly fine. Thank you. Okay, this is nice. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Could you please upload my presentation or should I do it by myself? Oh, okay, I can, I can do it if you want. Um, one second. Yes. Um, so I retrieve it. Okay. Here. Nice. Okay, the floor is yours, Hera Lampas. Okay. <laughs> so, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks, thanks for the invitation in order to participate in this well-organized uh, seminar. It's my pleasure to participate in this and in any future uh, relative events. Um, representing the municipality of uh, Hanya, I would like to present you our uh, initiatives in order to reduce the emission of uh, CO2 and uh, also towards to neutralization of uh, uh, carbon emissions. So our uh, municipality, uh, for those that are not aware of uh, Hanya Crete, is located in uh, the island of Crete at the east side. Um, the, uh, the inhabitants are uh, 100,000 and 8,000 uh, people. Uh, and now we are about to present uh, uh, our main initiatives uh, in order to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, please uh, change. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, we all uh, we are all aware of uh, the climate change. Uh, this is uh, easily easy to to be discovered uh, through our everyday life, but it's also visible through the change, uh, big change that uh, takes place uh, in the meteorological uh, data, uh, which is something that is pretty obvious for somebody that uh, wants to uh, to notice this. And of course, this is the main reason uh, that we need to act uh, in order to have uh, the best results possible. Uh, obviously, the main objectives and aims are uh, well known also, both for uh, the European Union and also uh, across the world uh, concerning the reduce of uh, at least 40% uh, of uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, in this way, municipality of Hanya um, uh, takes action and has uh, have a numerous of initiatives uh, in the area, first of all, of uh, mitigation, which is the one main area. Uh, which includes uh, the renewable energy sources and the energy saving uh, policy 
policies and actions, but uh, mitigation uh, is not all, uh, longer enough. So we need to proceed uh, urgently uh, also to the adaptation uh, in order to be able to be adapted uh, to the climate change and have uh, less impact uh, possible. Um, let me change, change please this, okay. Now let's move to the next also. Yes, we already talked about the mitigation and adaptation, and now we need to proceed to the next one, which, uh, which has to do with the role of the cities. And we all know that it's a very important, uh, this is a very important role. Uh, as long as the 75% uh, uh, of uh, European citizens uh, live in cities, and uh, 60 to 80 percent of energy co consumption uh, is coming from uh, the cities. Uh, all these challenges are uh, pretty important, of course, uh, because they are strongly related uh, with health and safety for the people that live in the cities. Uh, please, let's proceed to the next. In this way, uh, municipality of Hania is already has already signed the covenant of mayors since uh, 2014. Uh, we all know many details concerning this uh, covenant, and uh, basically the common vision is uh, the accelerating of the uh, decarbonization of our territories. Uh, by strengthening our capacity to adapt and, and avoid up the climate, climate change impact and allowing our citizens to access secure, sustainable and affordable energy. In this way, uh, I would like to proceed to uh, the, main, uh, the, main, the main actions uh, that took place in Hanya. Uh, and first of all is the formation of uh, overall strategic plan uh, we call it uh, uh, Energy An uh, Action Plan, uh, and it's based in uh, it's based in uh, United Nations Sustainability Objectives. Uh, in order to have uh, a, a plan, an overall plan, and uh, to be able to estimate uh, any time. Uh, our, achieve our achievements and uh, the impact uh, these achievements uh, have concerning our uh, objectives. Uh, let's go to the next one. Of course, this demands uh, a close cooperation, cooperation, first of all, uh, within the municipality of Hania, but also across Crete with other uh, municipality and prefecture of uh, Crete, and also. Uh, we need and uh, we have a close uh, cooperation, uh, both uh, nationwide and uh, across Europe. Let's go to the next. In order to to create this uh, overall plan, uh, we had a, a detailed uh, research concerning all the the consumptions that took place uh, across our municipality. Uh, in this table, you have a view that we have uh, the consumption uh, in every source of energy for every action or, or uh, for every service that the municipality provides. This is a, an important and necessary step in order to create uh, a, rea a realistic and effective uh, overall action plan. Let's move to the next. The results, the main results of this uh, uh, plan, uh, the overall results, uh, provided uh, to us uh, a diagram concerning the energy consumption of uh, Hanya municipality. Uh, you can see here that uh, the municip municipal buildings uh, are uh, more than the half of the energy that is consumed uh, across our municipality and uh, the other two 
factors is the transportation and uh, the street lights. Uh, let's move to the next. Okay. Uh, in this presentation, you can also see uh, the diagram of uh, the energy consumption related to each type uh, of uh, energy source and uh, the relative uh, CO2 emissions for each type. Let's move to the next one. Together with this, uh, we took, uh, we pay a lot of our attention concerning the adaptation. So we need to pay all our attention in order to, to eliminate uh, the, the effects of uh, climate change and to focus in a special uh, sectors or special uh, areas that we need to focus in order to prevent uh, negative results concerning the climate change in our uh, municipality. Let's move to the next. In addition, there are uh, numerous initiatives that uh, also took place in our uh, municipality. Uh, indicably, uh, I can uh, present you some of them uh, here, for example, the supply of uh, uh, electric uh, bus and scooters uh, for the municipality, the operation of a shared uh, biking system, uh, including six different uh, spots around the city center where uh, everybody could uh, have a, a bicycle for, uh, for almost free and to move around the city. Uh, we have uh, already implemented uh, renewable energy sources and energy efficiency application in uh, municipality schools. Uh, there are information uh, kiosks uh, operated in order to deliver uh, municipalities initiatives in adaptation and uh, mitigation actions. Uh, we move to the replacement, replacement of uh, street lighting with uh, new ones. Uh, complied with uh, LED technology, and uh, also uh, there is uh, we already made our applications in order to proceed to net metering and virtual net metering for uh, uh, the 23 buildings uh, and installations that uh, consume a lot of energy uh, across our municipality. Uh, those are the main initiatives that. Uh, took place in uh, Kanya and they are all included in our overall uh, action plan uh, which is also uh, a part of uh, obligation concerning our participation in the covenant. Uh, with these few words I would like to uh, to finish my presentation and uh, thank you for uh, attending. Uh, you might also see my email and uh, I'm also available for any questions uh, uh, in real time or answering them uh, uh, through the email uh, afterwards. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Lampas. Let's quickly check if we have one or two questions we can answer now. Um, in the chat box, I don't see any. Um, okay, was that one? No. Okay, I don't think we have any on this specific presentation, at least now, uh, except mine. Okay, it's if there uh, is any, my email address yeah, is available. It, it so is there, and as I said, the slides will be there. It would there. be my pleasure to answer. It would be my pleasure. Okay, actually, I, I do have one for you, Chiara Lampas. Yes. Um, I was curious, because I know Kanya is on an island, the island of Crete, and yes, islands do yes. encounter additional challenges in their climate and energy plans compared to inland territories, obviously. Could you tell us if you had one or two examples of how you had to, to take this into account in your actions for the city? Yes. Uh, first of all, the, the grid, the electric grid in Crete is isolated. 
because it is an island and there is not a connection with um, with the, with uh, the grid of uh, the electric grid of uh, Greece. This means that um, there are restrictions in the use of uh, renewable energy sources um, in order to have uh, a stable uh, a grid uh, network. Uh, this also means that um, it's not easy for everyone to get a permission to apply renewable energy sources because there is a limit on uh, uh, the island because it is isolated so this is this also forms one more uh, obstacle that uh, has uh, somebody to uh, to overcome in order to apply these uh, initiatives and on the other hand uh, climate change is uh, is pretty obvious in uh, islands uh, like Crete uh, instead of other uh, regions uh, across Greece or across uh, Europe. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Um, I will take one more question. We have one from Isabella from Energy Contour Nord in Sweden. She's asking in slide nine, how did you find those numbers? So we will go back to the slide uh, yes. mentioned. Yes, the, uh, the numbers, uh, it, uh, it has to do with the, the big table. Yeah. Yes. This one. Uh, this one, yes, exactly. Ah. Okay, in order to create the actual plan, we need to measure all the consumption that we have co uh, concerning every uh, energy source and uh, every service that we provide. So this uh, table uh, derives from the data that we have inside the municipality. But it was not easy to include all of them in one table. So we need to have the cooperation that I mentioned before uh, among our among the services and the people in the working the municipality in order to get and collect all this data uh, in order to create and uh, finalize our action plan. Okay, I think uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much, Kara Lampas. Um, You're okay. welcome. I think I will leave one more minute uh, to see if there are some general course, questions no problem. for any speakers. Mm -hmm. um, let me put back this. Um, okay, but I think uh, each speaker had uh, several questions, so thank you again for your engagement. Uh, this means that uh, carbon neutrality and energy planning is, uh, is very important for all of us. And uh, personally, I was really inspired by everything that, uh, that I heard today. So thanks again to all our speakers. Um, so to the five speakers, do you have any concluding remarks you would like to tell our participants before closing the webinar? Just keep walking. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a good one. Uh, okay, well, um, let me tell you, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we're a little bit over time, uh, but I think for most of you, lunch break hasn't started yet, so you can go and you will know that uh, you've been with us until the end. Um, I hope you will be inspired when you come back to work in January by what you heard today. As I said, the webinar is being recorded and will be available with the slides online soon and I will send them to each participant who has registered. And well, Merry Christmas everyone, have a nice break if you do have uh, holidays and uh, hopefully let's all cooperate on this next year. Thank you everyone, goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. Parce que...